Welcome to the Sandersonian Institute of Cosmere Studies, where there's always another secret. Welcome back to the Sandersonian Institute of Cosmere Studies, episode 14. Today is September 17th, 2018. I got the date right this time. Yay! I double checked before. We don't so have to I fix it in post. Right. <laughs> no, we fixed it in current. Yeah. I, think that's, I think that's just called getting it right. <laughs> Well, welcome back to the show, everybody. I am Bill, and I am joined, as always, by my comprehensive co-hosts, Amy and Jordan. Hello, hello. Hi. Bill, In this episode, you're, pe you're peeking a ton. I'm peeking? I'm sorry. I'm talking yeah. excitedly. You are anyway, excited. In this episode, we are going to be concluding our discussion of The Way of Kings, the first book in Brandon Sanderson's Stormlight Archive. In part four of our discussion tonight, we will be covering all of the little tidbits and juicy bits that we have had to gloss over in the past three ep episodes. This will include things like the prologue of the story, the interludes, and the epigrams at the top of each chapter. For those of you who listen to the podcast recordings or watch videos on YouTube, we'd like to remind you that it's possible for our listeners to interact with us via live chat as we record each episode live at www.twitch.tv slash innkeepers table. We record episodes of the Sandersonian Institute of Cosmere Studies of Cosmere Studies, I know the word, every other Monday night starting at 7.30 p.m. Pacific Time, 10.30 p.m. Eastern Time. So please join us and take an active part of the discussion. Um, or now, don't. We're not the boss of you. <laughs> but we you like to always, pretend sometimes. You can always find us later. We're there. <laughs> it, it's fun interacting, but however works best for you, that's why we put it out in multiple formats. So That said, this is objectively the best. It is objectively the best because we're here and you can talk to us and we might even talk right back to you. So yeah. now for those of you who have listened to last week's episode or episode or have been following us on social media, you already know this. But for those who may not be aware, we are holding a giveaway. We were fortunate enough to have Brandon Sanderson himself sign a copy of Arcanum Unbounded while we were at Fanex in Salt Lake City. Now, y'all might not be aware of this. This copy was my personal copy because mm -hmm. I didn't have the forethought to buy a copy before Fanex itself. So I went to my own bookshelf, grabbed the book, and took it with me. So you will be taking my copy. I've already replaced it with another one, but this is the original so i don't know if that makes it a better prize or a worse one or what but definitely better it. and we had him sign it to a listener of the sandersonian institute of cosmere studies that's his signature right there and so our listeners can enter to to win this prize to enter the drawing Go to our Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram, prof Instagram profiles at, at Cosmere Studies on each of those and find the post from last Wednesday, September 12th, where we announce the giveaway and then tag in that post one of your friends who is a Brandon Sanderson fan. You can enter once on each platform. Yep, and if you're a patron, you also get an entry. Mm -hmm. Which is cool. So. Yep. Um, now, before we get started, we just want to remind those who may just be tuning in for the first several episodes basically the next not the next but the first year or so of this podcast we're looking at each book individually and taking a broad look of the plot of those books and discussing the characters the actions and then where it sort of falls into the rest of the cosmere later on we're also going to start discussing some of the more I'm not sure what the word I'm looking for is the different concepts that permeate the entire series juicy. and <laughs> the juicy I'm looking for a noun. That's not a noun. The, the juice. juice. 
<laughs> the ligaments that tie them all together. Yes, later on we'll dive into this. <laughs> we'll dive into the ligaments. We've got this. You I was looking it. for an adjective. Anyway, this is really what we want to be spending our time on tonight. Yeah. We have so much free time. But we're going to start discussing the aluminum hat, or aluminum foil hat theories, both our own and those that our listeners, that's you, submit to us. So if you've got an idea about the Cosmere that you want us to talk on, about on the show, make sure to email it to us at cosmerestudies at gmail.com. Over the past several episodes, we've talked about the major plot points of the novel, but now it's time to get into the nitty gritty. We are going to be focusing on the smaller background stories that have been popping up in the interludes and the like. Now, this is one of the things that I feel kind of separates the the Stormlight Archive from the rest of Brandon's books and from a lot of them, because these interludes, they're really, really interesting but they don't really have a whole lot of direct impact on the main course of the story with the exception of Seth, because while what he's doing isn't necessarily directly impacting what's happening to Shalon, Dalinar and Kalanen at the moment, you know, it's gonna have a big impact. But now before we dive in, we try to avoid spoilers through the majority of our chats. This episode, we're giving our spoiler warning right here at the top of the hour because there's just no way to get into all the stuff that we're talking about without hitting on some spoilers. So yeah. if you're fresh, new into the Cosmere, this is definitely not the episode to jump in on. For the rest of you, though, we're excited to sink our teeth into some of these little bits. So... Um, so I'm thinking, so before we dive in, I actually, this is not a part of the story. I was looking through and I really liked the way that he dedicated this book. Mm-hmm. Just especially because the way it's arranged on the page, it's almost a visual poem. He dedicates it to his wife. It says for Emily, who is too patient, too kindly and too wonderful for words. But I try anyway. It's Gushy. But it made me smile. So, <laughs> But that's all the time we want to spend on that one. So next, the prelude to the Stormlight Archive. Oh. So this is, I, I feel like this section was very, very influenced by his, um, his fandom for Robert Jordan. Because at the very beginning of the Wheel of Time, there was a scene that took place hundreds of years before the bulk of the of the series and it starred a major character who essentially didn't play a major part in the current story but still had a very strong impact on the world itself and I feel like Brandon kind of took that idea and wove it into his own epic that he's putting together I have not read the Wheel of Time well okay correction I read book one and part of book two of the wheel of time Hmm. so i didn't know that at all well if you've read book one then you've seen it because it's It's been a long time yeah it it, it's a it's an enmitious rays um scene where there's just all this carnage around and you have no idea what's going on Mm -hmm. and at the end of the prologue you still have no idea what's going on and then he takes you to somewhere completely different and you're just sitting there like wait wait Okay. What was that about? <laughs> I must have forgotten that entirely because mm-hmm. it's, it's been long enough. And yeah, that I, I, I have no idea details. what we're talking about. We love time. I know. Anyway. Anyway. Yeah. But the thing is, Brandon does the same sort of thing here where, again, you come in and it's after this huge carnage. Just look around. Everything has been destroyed. And then you find out the term that he's using for these events is desolations. That's very fitting. And it makes sense. Yeah. So it we reminds do- me. It reminds me of like Lord of the Rings with a lot of the big battles that way too. Mm-hmm. Especially at end of Way of King or not Way of Kings, but Return of the King. Yeah. The return of the way of the two King's Towers. <laughs> My head hurts. <laughs> what have you done, Jordan? <laughs> Hurt your head apparently. It's great. Anyway. So, uh, 
Well, let, let's talk about what happens. So we come in and... Who's that? I can't remember is it, which... Is it Kellek? Is it... I will look. Kellek? I, I do not remember. Kellek's breath? Kellek. Yeah, it is Kellek. I only know it because we take his name in vain. I don't think we're honoring it's, this man properly. It's, it's Kalak. K A L A. That's right. But and it's and it's sort of shifted over the. Uh, that's one thing that's really interesting is you see Kalak. these names and dialects shift as you look into the the past relics and into the Ars Arcanum at the back of the book and that kind of stuff. It's just yeah. Brandon's attention to detail. Mm-hmm. So. I, I don't know anyone else who does that sort of thing in their books, but it's it perfectly fits, especially over a long narrative. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, all you have to do is look at towns here in America that started off being, you know, called some Native American name, but white people mm -hmm. couldn't pronounce it long enough that it's now pronounced something different. I mean, I, I'm from Alabama. Yeah, Alabama uh, itself is a very Native American name. <laughs> yeah, in, so. in Washington there's a lot of Native American names but they, I don't think of them that way until I stop and go, oh wait, no, that, that one is and that one is and that one is and that one is. So there's just a lot of them. Like, the word Puyallup, like, no one can say that unless you're from Washington because it's not spelled at all like you would think. Right. Is but, And I'm, I'm guessing Tuella in, here in Utah is Oh my goodness, I could, I could not spell that thing at first. I was like, what? It's Thule. <laughs> You're wrong. It's Thule. It can't be Tawilla. This is but, yeah. but back to the desolation. So yes. we have this guy who just sort of. He's amazed that he survived. Yeah, he, he basically. That he has. It's almost like he's waking up from this battle that just happened, almost, you mm -hmm. know, almost mentally separated from it. And he find he finds out that shockingly all but one one of his friends who go through this cycle of battle and death and torture and battle and death and I mean what kind of existence is that? That's a horrible. <laughs> or a Tom Cruise film. Yeah, well. It, the difference is he just dies because it's very Groundhog Day. Mm -hmm. In those films, they just die and that's it. They just die. And mm -hmm. then they wake up the next day. Uh, we know that they're getting tortured. Um, <laughs> horrible. Well, I, I find it interesting that at the, at the very end of the book, when we run into someone who we think is this last um, herald who who did die he starts listing off if you need if you haven't achieved bronze working you can you know this person will teach you and each of them has their roles as they're preparing for these horrible apocalyptic battles and mm -hmm. it's just interesting that they've created this cycle it's almost a an engine where they know okay this is what we need to have this is what they might be lacking this is who can train in the and it's just sort of a very interesting their, concept of preparedness. Yeah, they all have their own little niche that, you know, they know what they're supposed to do for preparedness for it. it and it, it has, uh, it's reminiscent of the Greek pantheon. You know, they each have their realm that they sort of lead. And, you know, this, this person is in charge of teaching this. This is person can guide them. And I also find it interesting. I'm I'm a fan of Star Trek. I've watched it a lot. It's almost the opposite of the Prime Directive. Because they show up, you know, the, the Prime Directive is when you show up in a place, you don't teach anybody anything if they haven't learned it, they're not ready to. And this one is just, okay, we've got to get ready. This event is coming. And so we will teach you what you need to know if you haven't achieved it yet. Speed up civilization right now. Mm -hmm. Until you're to a certain point. Because they know that Again, this desolation is on the horizon. So, mm -hmm. it's it's a very interesting cycle, and just what it mm -hmm. all set up. It's interesting. This is the big event that everyone centers their religion on, and he shows it to us right at the start. 
Right. And I, the first time around, I did not connect that that's what he was talking about. Oh, yeah, there same here. so much going on. But, like, second time around, I was like, oh, how did I miss this? It's mm-hmm. right there, and it's so big. Well, and, and the thing that's interesting is you have these the heralds, you know, when you look at what they've done, that's a heroic act. Oh. But then you see suddenly, especially when you, when you have the conversation between Kalek and... I can't remember the other one who shows Je- up. I think it's Jezrian. Yeah, Jezrian. Jez- yeah, Jezrian. And as they're discussing, and Collect sees the look in Jezrian's eyes, and he just realizes, I'm not the only one who's broken. Everyone's... And, and suddenly he realizes that they have all already decided that the Oath Pact is done, and suddenly everything is now resting on the shoulders of the one person who fell in battle. One poor guy. You just feel bad for Tolin a lot. Mm-hmm. I mean, ten people have been taking on this burden. I don't know if it multiplies or if they were just sort of there as a redundancy. But I think I think they weren't all guaranteed to fall, but it was just that since there were ten of them, they could handle the burden between them, mm-hmm. and the other ones would just kind of—I can't remember if they hung out or what. How, well, they until, until they, until they, I, I think they actually were supposed to return. Like they chose to go back or something, didn't they? Well, no. So yeah. the idea is that they, how, we don't know the mechanics of it, but we know the mechanic is the fact that somehow them being dead holds back the void bringers. Right. And they, while they're there, yeah. they get tortured by the void bringers. But as long as one stands. The the basically the the gate is down, mm-hmm. and the moment that they're all you know there's not one of them in the way, the floodgates are opened, and so right. I think it's so more it's... an issue of th- like sudden suddenly they just said all right, we're gonna have none of the safeties of the fact that we'll have uh, you know all ten of us there, right? Because there's no layers, there's just the one guy now. It's the one guy all of them say that he's going to last the longest of all of us. He always does. He is does. the greatest of them, yes. Yeah, but if like, if you think about it, if you're like, if that's the situation, you tend to start with those who break quicker. And so they're essentially removing the buffer he would ever bring on for the rest of the team. And it's it's one of those things, it's, you know... You, you understand the the weight of the betrayal, but you all but because it's Brandon, you also understand the weight of the burden and how these aren't people who have broken their word lightly. It's these are people who have just been pushed to the edges, are going to live forever, and they're just like, I can't do this anymore. Right. This was a bad system. It's just well, it's one of those things they honestly probably didn't realize just how awful it was going to be and but you see they feel guilty they feel not just guilty they feel shame for yeah, the fact they don't want they don't want to see each other again after this they're like we're not mm-hmm. going to associate or anything because they just don't want the... but it it makes perfect sense uh that they wouldn't understand what they agreed to because well, of course when you're nobody's more... done it before yeah well and who can con- understand the concept of an eternity. That's just not something you you understand. Mm-hmm. So, it makes perfect sense that they essentially that yes, they made a promise to do it, but they didn't know what they were promising. In the end, they're still. I. I, I want to say human, but you know this Mortal? is. No human, they're, someone else completely. There, it's almost like they're still finite in their. In exactly. Respect. In the but end, they're, they're still they're... imperfect beings. Yeah. And so it's just, it's a very interesting way to start off this whole series. The thing that is cool, though, is it gives it an enormous scope. Oh, yeah. Because you see this battle where mountains have been torn asunder. And you just realize, okay, this is, we're dealing with large forces here. <laughs> It's almost like all just of the a deaths few. like World War One or World War Two in one mm-hmm. battle. You know, just massive amounts of people. Mm-hmm. 
and then suddenly you jump to a completely different time period where all of these things are forgotten relics that and well actually you don't jump to the well you jump to the time period you jump to Zeth. So <laughs> right, yeah. That lovely scene. And I know that, that Jordan, he's one that you've been aching to talk about. Oh, so. <laughs> well, I don't understand. Seth is, uh, everyone loves Seth. He's a great guy. Um, he's not insane in any way. Nah. He's got Speaking this. Broken, he's someone who's got things together. <laughs> Seth is a really interesting character because he is the, he's a sympathetic zealot. And he's not, he's not just sympathetic. He's You feel bad for him. Yep. Because he just he is so perfectly adherent to the laws that he has been raised to. And he hates that he's so good at what he does. Mm -hmm. Because it means he can be a horrible weapon for whoever happens to have his oath stone. That's, uh, that's actually one of the th things that shows up in, I believe it's... Not the last scene that he's in, but the but the Second ninth the interlude, last? the ninth oh. interlude. So where he is killing the king of Yakovet. Yeah. And right. the king tells him that it was a trap, and he's just like, "Oh, you just made a mistake." It's Why? Like, oh, because don't, we under don't and, trap and, and, more people with me in here, because then I'm gonna have to kill them all. <laughs> he said, "You set a trap at it for me at a banquet, so I can blame their deaths on you." And suddenly he unleashes rage. Yep. Which he's not used to doing. Mm -hmm. He uh, well, he tries the, to be a good guy. The image, because because when he kills um, the king of Yakoved, his orders are to slaughter and destroy and just mm -hmm. mutilate and do as much destruction as he can, and he hates every second of it. But he's and, good at it. And he hates that he's so good at it. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, as he's doing it, there are tears flowing from him. And yeah. it's just, it's interesting that he is so controlled by this oath. Yeah, he is, uh, he, uh, he's the embodiment of, uh, just, he keeps his word. Mm -hmm. And he yeah. swore that he would follow whoever has his oath stone you're like oh okay so he's got no no you don't understand he's going to follow everything you tell him the guy tells him to start cutting up his own arm and he doesn't even he doesn't even blink mm -hmm. you're just like oh huh this is uh that's hmm, horrible that's but interesting then but then there's the concept because after he kills gavilar he's um and the the Parshendi throw his stone to the side. He goes, he gets it, and he stands by the side of the road, but first, he discards his clothing so it will be more more difficult for them to recognize him. Because if they recognize him, they're more likely to kill him. And even though he wants, he wants to die, he cannot make it easier mm -hmm. for somebody to kill him. Yeah. It, just the, the degree that he follows that letter where it's not he, just you he, can't kill yourself it's you cannot let anyone kill you if it is within your power yeah that's but a I mean, that's a thorough yeah thorough oath there because the, one, the longer he lives the more he will suffer and he deserves to suffer the interesting thing that he does he does conceal some things from the people who have his own stone though he does he makes sure that they don't know that he has a shard blade if he can help it at all not just a shard blade, the, but, an honor blade. Yeah, an yeah. honor blade. And we don't find that out until the next book, I don't think. Do we? We we know it's... I think he says it's an honor blade. No, he, he, call, he refers to it as a shard blade the whole time. He mentions that it's a particular weapon. I think we don't find out it's an honor blade until the second book. Yeah, I think that might be right. Because I think... But, yeah. But yeah, I just it was interesting like that he doesn't point things out to his people or his masters until they like are like, Oh well you have to, you know, go ahead and kill yourself. He's like, I'm not allowed to do that. Mm -hmm. But he's not about to mention that until they ask. So he he does little things that he that aren't bending the rules, but he tries to do a little bit of self preservation anyway, even just that slight bit there. Well, for example, when he's told to go in and kill somebody, he chooses the path where he will not be forced to kill the guards. 
Yes. He says, and he says he does that to hold on to the li one li remaining shred of humanity that he has left to himself. Yeah. That's not. That's not scary. No. It's it's interesting though to see as he passes his oath stone passes from one person to the other, how differently they treat they him. But him. he 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 recognizes. They seem to sort of feel a little guilty about owning somebody who obeys them to the degree that he will. Because, I mean, that's going to make anybody uneasy. And well, then he, he has one master who, like, mm -hmm. speaks roughly and he speaks so smoothly and eloquently and they're like, all of, all of the master's friends are like, really? You're you're in control of this guy who talks mm -hmm. like that? So that was kind of Well, and the fact that he focuses on the fact that they hate him because... Mm -hmm. The thing is, all of them understand something intrinsically that he is more competent than them. Than them. And then at oh, yeah. some point, just that weight builds up on them. And mm -hmm. it's not until the very end where he finally gets a master who... Knows what he can do. Yeah, knows what he can do. Oh. Mm -hmm. The heel... <laughs> the the heel turn. Is this, yeah. The heel oh. turn by Taravangian. Oh my gosh, that was so... Well, that was I love the way that he reveals himself to Seth, too. He tells Zeth to kill him through a different party. So this guy doesn't know that Taravangian is his master. Yeah, because he's like, if I wasn't on the list, then it would be obvious that I would, you know, mm -hmm. I'm taking myself off the, the suspicious <laughs> thing that you're supposed to kill me too. Because just... Taravangian is... <sighs> as soon as we find out, oh, oh my, this is... <laughs> he's not just the nice kingling, you know grandpa he's no he's so he's crazy. so much worse <laughs> and the worst part about him is that he has a point what like, do you mean well just he had that vi like he's following the diagram so yeah. so completely mm -hmm. and he knows that he had like that it's not irresponsible of him to follow the diagram yeah, and and we have given spoiler warnings, so we can, we can talk about the diagram if we if we oh, yeah. need to. But um, but yeah, he's just when Taravangian looks at Seth, and he's just like, "You've got a lot of work to do." <laughs> and it's like, "No, I didn't want that." And Ter and Zeth, you know, thinks to himself, "This is my absolute nightmare, to be wielded by somebody with the ambition and the cunning." to use me as the weapon that to my full potential. Yeah. I'm sure it'll be fine. Oh yeah, not a problem at all. Now, yeah. one th one thing that's kind of cool is in one of the interludes, uh it's the one where we follow Rissen. Mm -hmm. The the what's it called? What are they called? The Thalen. The, Thalen. the, the Thalen, yeah. yes. The Thalen trading apprentice. Mm -hmm. Where they actually go to Shinovar and and meet the Shin culture just fascinates it's cool. me. Cool, yeah. Because I, I especially I, it might just be because Zeth is bald, but it keeps making me think of the Air Nomads from Avatar: The Last oh. Airbender. I could see that, yeah. Especially because he's flying through the air, dancing along, and so I'm immediately just thinking Avatar. And then we find out the culture itself is just so fascinating and almost backwards, which is how what Risen notices. Mm -hmm. You know, she, she sees amazed that the master, the guy on the horse, and it is the important person is a farmer. She's he's like, a farmer, not just like are you kidding me, <laughs> and not just a landowner. He actually goes out and works the fields. Mm -hmm. She says, he "But there's all food, but there's dozens of you know farmers in all these cities. Yes, they're considered holy places. <laughs> yes. Well, and, and like, the warriors are expendable. They're not important. Yeah. It, well, and it makes perfect sense given what." Uh... Just given where they live, that it's it's a very different world for them, right? Yeah. And I don't know. I, I found it just fascinating, and I I like uh, that we have Rissen's perspective. I love her calling like how she's just like it's like everything here is slow witted because it doesn't move and retract. Yeah, because she's so used to everything. The plants moving and and pulling in and everything. Yeah. Like that, yeah. And it was, it's interesting that 
the goal with trading there is you want to make things sound worthless. And what's more worthless compared to where in most places you're like, oh no, this is an awesome item and you want to like build it up, but there you want it to sound more worthless. I love that actually because it's not just you want it to, to make it sound worthless, it's you are proving your sincerity, how genuine you are. Mm -hmm. Because if you're trying to trick them, they don't like that. And they're not going to give you good price. Which if like you are upfront well. with them and completely honest, they'll trust you and they'll give you more. And I've actually thought I'm kind of the same way in certain things. Like if, if you're upfront with me, I'll give you the world. But if you try and trick me, it's just like, okay, you're dead to me. Mm -hmm. So I just, I, I, it's interesting that the entire culture is sort of based around that. And, but it's it makes sense for a culture that you know is all about like as if we see from Zeth keeping to your word truthless yeah and like that's the worst thing you can be is someone who is without truth to the point where you deserve to suffer for years on end yeah at th that point then we're starting to like okay guys maybe we could have you know Dialed it back he's, a little bit, just you know. He's worked off his debt by now, right? Except, to them, there is no working off the debt. It's just, yeah. which leads to some very interesting stuff in the second book. But we'll go into that in several weeks down the road. So, um, yeah, and then we talked about just sort of how things are sort of backwards because it's the, you know, the soldiers are considered the lowliest. And then, of course, the truth list is even farther below. The other thing that's interesting is we find out that Vistim is the one who brought Zeth out of Shinovar. Yes, that he's, he was connected that way. But he didn't keep him very long, I didn't think, right? Mm -hmm. He sold him off pretty quick. Yeah. It is. It just occurred to me that um, both Rock's people, the Horn Eaters, mm -hmm. and the Shin have the whole farmer, you know, like, soldiers are lower. Yeah. Because the Rocker with the Rock... Horn eaters, I can totally speak. There, like, isn't it like the fourth or third son or something like that is considered uh, eligible for being a soldier versus they need the other people to be the farmers and everything. I think else. so. Cooks and stuff like that. Yeah, it, ma and it well, makes. Now we have extras, so you can be the ones who could potentially die. Well, they both live in sort of mountainous areas where it's harder mm -hmm. to grow things. Mm -hmm. And so they also have deal. the they also have the mountains that act, sort of act as blocks for the high storms. Mm hmm. That's, okay, so it's fascinating. Yep. So let's move on to a different interlude. This one is my favorite just because it crosses over into the rest of the Cosmere, and we all know that that's one of my favorite parts. Um, the scene in the Pure Lake. It's sick. So the Pure Lake is just such a cool concept to me because it's just miles upon miles of just shallow water. It sounds like it like isn't like six feet is about as deep as it gets. That's it's the deepest like that. it gets, yeah. Which kind of reminds me of, and I'm, I'm I wouldn't be surprised if Brandon was influenced by this, but in Provo, Utah, there's a lake called Utah Lake, and it's an incredibly shallow lake. It only get I don't think it gets much gets deeper than ten feet really anywhere. No, it doesn't. And people boat in it all the time, and so it's just again this concept of a a huge but shallow lake. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. I like how the towns are built in the lake, allowing a few inches of water because yeah, yeah. the people that, who grew up there, that's just natural to them. I, that, that part made me just kind of cringe. Cause I'm like, I can't imagine having like a few inches of water in every single room of my house. That just, I just think of the squishing. Oh, I just think my goodness. eternal oh. raisin feet. Yeah. I, well, and their religion is straight up bonkers. <laughs> you're not supposed to talk about, you're supposed to say you, you worship one of the brothers, even though you're actually worshiping the other one because you don't want the one that you claim to be worshiping to get to jealous. To get jealous. And curse you. Yeah, it's just like. But the one that you actually worship is older and wiser and less likely. And so he's just like, you know what? So he, but he knows that you're I worshiping know. him, even though. Yes. <laughs> it's just like. It's just. Convoluted. I love it though. 
And it was I the know first. you know. I understand. I get the concept. <laughs> Yeah, it's very it's very Hades in, in Zeus actually. Mm-hmm. At least Disney's Hades and Zeus. Yeah, because <laughs> the Athel. I, I've I've listened to some random stuff about the mythology, like Greek uh-huh. and mythology, and I'm like, oh wow, there's a lot more to this than I ever knew in high school oh, or in so college, much. and I'm just like, oh wow. Anyway, but yeah, yeah. The Disney fight Hades is different. Oh, um, quite. Yeah, but there's. Let's see. So yeah, so he's he's a fisherman. Is Ishik? Is he? Yeah. He goes around yeah. and he. It's fish. fishes I, I love the also in their culture the concept of debt and how it works so basically you do oh. things for somebody so that they owe you rather mm-hmm. than asking somebody and being in their debt you do enough so that they are they're forced to be in your debt they are forced to be in your debt yeah, and there's, the, there's the a... back and forth between him and this this lady, is yeah. basically a, an innkeeper mm. it's who kind of funny he's who's like, got hey. a crush on him <laughs> He fed me again. Oh, now I really owe her. <laughs> He's like, oh, she's gonna marry. She's gonna make me marry her eventually. I don't want to do that. He's like, but here, here's this one fish that I found that's incredibly lucky. I'll and give it, it to you. With your joints. And she's like, oh. <laughs> that's gonna be good for at least two weeks. Of, ah, dang it. I, how am I ever gonna catch you? And I love the the fact he thinks to himself, perhaps he would let her catch him someday. <laughs> He's just, he's a very likable character because oh, he's, yes. he's, he's, he's one of the most chill characters you've you'll ever meet. It's the other thing that's interesting about just him is the fact that we 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 obvi- we meet people uh, who are from other series, obviously, and we sit there and think, okay, why would you want this guy? Because frankly, he doesn't exactly appear very useful. <laughs> But, you know, he it turns mm-hmm. out he actually is because he goes around and he, mm-hmm. he, he travels. He knows people and he talks to everybody and they're all friendly with him. And so he gets lots of information that way. And I love the nicknames he gives to everyone. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So let's talk about these three strangers who appear because they actually show up. And when I found this out, it blew my mind. Oh, but they I actually show it. up in each of them in a different series in the Cosmere. So we've got Grump, who yeah. is, if, if you've been listening from the very beginning, our first book we talked about was Elantris and Galadon. Now, and I think he was sort of, he was basically the one that triggered people onto the idea that these people may be characters that we've seen. Um, because it's- he has some very distinct speech patterns. Yeah, the, the, to me, that's the more impressive part is the fact that after people figured this out based mm-hmm. upon the speech patterns. And it's one of those details, once you know it and you go back and read it, like, I still, I don't remember enough about what Galadon and Demu look like. But the thing that's interesting is how he looks at them. He's like, oh, he must be a, I can't remember what it was. I think like a, a horn eater because Maca- it's or a makabaki because Ma- his skin makabaki. is yeah makabaki because his skin is dark, yeah. there's there's two makabaki looking yeah and their skin's kind of dark oh so they're makabaki kind of a weird looking makabaki but okay whatever uh huh and just sort of like wait a minute which is another reason that Ishik is a good viewpoint character for this because he notices it and then he's like ah whatever and so Brandon's able to put in the clues without focusing on. Focusing on it too much. Yeah. And allowing us to sort of discover. But, you know, Galadon had some very distinct speech patterns in Elantris where he Mm -hmm. would always refer to um, to Raiden as Suli. Mm -hmm. And whenever he finished a sentence, he'd always, you know, end it in Kolo. And in this, he refers to somebody as friend and ends it in understand, which is what those two terms roughly translated to. And so the fact that people actually picked up on this, I love. Yeah. Now, I think that the actual trigger, though, was uh, at the very end of the interlude, he actually says something in his own language. And we don't, I don't, we don't know what the two, first two words are, but the last one, I think, is like Kayana, I don't which remember. apparently means fool or fool or, or crazy, I think is what it was. And it's, that was a term that he'd used in Elantris, and people were like, wait, that word. 
That word. I know. I, that I, word. I've heard that word somewhere. It's a name so I haven't heard in a long time. <laughs> and so they found that, and I, so I think Galadon was the first one people recognized. But then, the one people are also very familiar with is Thinker. Who oh. now? Now, one thing I noticed is that the name that he chooses for himself is Timu. It's like okay, so it's not too far from his actual name, actually. He changes you think like the first syllable almost. So uh huh. It seems like it's the only real difference. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's Demu or Demo, but yeah. It's just so. Uh, crap! I got come up with a fake name. I'm. Uh, uh, Gordon. Uh, <laughs> Gordon. Yes, and I am Will. And I'm maybe. I don't. <laughs> it's just like. Do you think will he buy it? I think he bought it. Yeah, yeah, okay. Oh, cool. Yeah, we're good, we're good. Yeah. And then the other one is uh is Bayon from the White Sands that he goes by Veo or Veya. Yeah, so it's it's close enough. But at the same time Ishik recognizes these aren't their real names. They're pretty close to their real names though, so It turns out they're just not very good at undercover work. Uh-huh. Which makes sense. Dabu was a soldier. Galadon was, uh... He was a son of a scholar. And he was grumpy. Yeah. Always grumpy. It's just, I love just... I mean, he was known as the grumpy... Uh, what are they called? Duladin. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Which everyone's like, that's not supposed to be... That's you're wrong. There's no such thing. Be, you're supposed to be happy. What are you talking about? It's, it's actually interesting to think, okay, so after all this time... He's still grumpy. <laughs> it's almost like <gasps> it's part of his personality. Indeed. Shocking. The other thing that was interesting about that is the fact that they're chasing Hoyd. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Makes well, you wonder and what, what led them to start chasing Hoyd. I, yeah. yeah. Well, and, and how they started world hopping. And... Well, and that's referenced in one of the epigrams in the letter that we see later. They he talks about your friends from the 17th Charter. You know, they're on my trail. Um, you mind stopping that? <laughs> At the same time, he says that, and I swear Brandon's writing that to the website, the 17th Shard. <laughs> they're on my trail. Could um, we... Except that I think the 17th Shard was actually named after the 17th Shard in the book. I, I like, I, want it, but I want it the other way around. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that the term came first, before the website. Oh, I know well, that's not as cool. Yeah, well, we should go with my way. <laughs> oh, Jordan. Anyway, so yeah, just interesting stuff all around in Pure Lake. Um, now, Interlude Two is a little bit creepier. Yeah. Where we take a look at Shalon's older brother, Nambalat. We talked about that a little bit. Um, we did. Yeah, in the Shalon episode. Yeah. yeah. But he likes pulling crustaceans apart. Because it's a stress reliever. And raising not dogs, but calling them hounds. And that's frankly the more disturbing part. <laughs> to be fair, they don't know what hounds actually are, so... They're trying real hard. Mm, I'll have to just <laughs> accept that, I think. Uh, but Nambala just... I don't know. The thing that's interesting, though, is that he says, you know... You know, breaking and, and killing, killing things helps him... But never humans. Like he's just—it's just interesting seeing his thought process, where he's justified killing these smaller things, but he still there is a line. And he's like, "I'm not so. crossing the line. I'm not crossing the line." You know, mm -hmm. and that's—and he's—he's engaged, right? He's the one who's engaged. Yes. It—it uh, re it reminds me Aelita. very. Yeah, it reminds me very much of. Uh, Oh, what was it? Uh, Dan Wells' book series. Um, I'm not a serial killer. Yeah, that Very series much. where the the main character has similar issues and has rules he has to follow. It and just but he's he's created these. I'm trying to think what's the term. It's basically a venting mechanism, you know, a defense mechanism, so that he doesn't cross that line. He's like, okay, a release valve. I'm not going to do like, that. Yeah, exactly. She's like, and I'm guys, not going to do this, but yeah. to, to keep myself from doing this, I am allowing myself this. Yeah, there's, um, I haven't read the books, but I watched part of the show, and it's it's super dark and very mature, but Dexter, have you guys? I read the first that? book. I 
I've he's, been familiar he, with it, but he's a he's a, a serial killer who kills killers. Yeah. So anyway, but he has lots of rules and set things that he has to do and mm -hmm. whatever else. But made me think of that too. So. But yeah, yeah so. he's he's. It's just one of those things. It just shows. It, it definitely does a good job of giving context to uh, how desperate her family is. Yeah, and how I, I don't remember where because you have you met you've met Shalom by that point but you don't yeah know too we've much met her and then yeah. you meet him and it's we, like, we've had a couple of chapters with her but she, she's already become Yesna's ward I believe at that point by the oh okay I guess yeah but the the issue is just the fact that you just find out oh yeah when she says they're in a desperate situation it's it's not just a situation born of finances that's the problem mm -hmm. it's the fact mm -hmm. that no one is equipped in the family to really deal with the situation and the only person who was their eldest brother He's is dead. dead yes do they know that at that point yes, yes they do. Yeah, okay. he, he actually actively says heleron is dead because remember he was non-heleron and now non-balat is the eldest well but i thought he was non-heleron because his father, his father disowned, disowned him. him not because of the death he disowned him he, 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 he does, refer, he does say this he does say that he's dead though Okay. Yes. Yeah. In the, but in the inter, interlude, I think but, it gets reported back to them or something that he died, mm -hmm. but they don't know how exactly. Well, by this point, point, it happened. Yeah, it happened some time before. Yeah. Anyway. But, but they don't know who did it or right. anything. Yeah. yeah. So en oh. enough about serial killers or not non-serial <laughs> killers who refuse to be serial killers. Yeah. Anyway, so we talked a little bit about Rissen. I want to talk a little bit about the Thalen culture because that's the thing I love about these interludes is I feel like the strongest purpose they serve is to build the world. Because it gives you there's... this little snippet that you're like, oh, so that there's a whole other thing and it gives you just enough depth that you can sit there and go, there is a whole other culture and a whole other continent or whatever else behind it compared to just, they're just a pop-in character, an NPC that's just there. It's it's almost like with the the new sort of setup they have for for the Star Wars, you have the numbered movies, which is the main story, mm -hmm. and then they have what they're referring to as a Star Wars story. So, you know, you have Rogue One, you have Solo. These are sort of the side things that build up the universe a little bit more without mm -hmm. being part of the main saga. Yeah. And you get different viewpoints in these interludes, which, you know, which allows Brandon to explore different thought processes and different cultures by having you step into the perspective of somebody in those cultures rather yeah. than you can step out of the Alethi and see any other mm -hmm. version of what's going on because it allows you to look at the culture by seeing what they notice is different and Risen mm -hmm. is the perfect example of that because oh, yeah. she is not the most open-minded individual <laughs> she's mm -hmm. these something that doesn't make sense to her and she says that's weird that's crazy that's ridiculous mm -hmm. instead of and her her Bobsk, um, you know, says no. It's not crazy. It's just different. Yeah, it's, it's not says, what you're used to. The Shin are odd. They're not odd. They're different. Odd is erratic, and the Shin are anything but erratic. He's like, that makes sense. You just have to understand mm -hmm. where they're coming from, and then it then it makes sense. Yeah. And yeah, the the coolest thing about the Shin, uh, the the Rissen uh, interlude is the fact that you get to see what's valuable to both uh yeah to both countries oh. or both peoples they're and, just giving away chickens yeah <laughs> they left. it makes perfect sense but it makes perfect sense that you know it, it it definitely gets into an economics question of what's valuable to who mm -hmm. and and what's interesting is the reason the chickens are valuable is because of what they can do what the reason the metal's valuable is because of the Shin's religious Where it came from. Yeah. And the mm -hmm. fact that it's it's soul cast. It's soul cast yeah. garbage. But because they don't have soul casters, that is immensely like desired by the the Shin. And so mm -hmm. getting this makes so much sense for them because Oh, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't violate any of our uh, our social norms. And their and then I just had a thought. Else. Technically, if they have the honor blades, they could have at least two people who could soul cast. In theory, yeah. In theory. 
Wait, do we know they have a second one? They've got nine of them, I believe. I have not kept track of them at all. I'm pretty sure they have most of the honor blades. Yeah, I thought that was the case as well. Yeah. I have not kept track of that at all. In fact, I, yeah. I, I think that the only one they don't have is Talenalot's. The one that Seth had. Well, the one that... No, Talenalot died. And so he oh. didn't leave his blade behind. Okay. I think that's the case. I, I, well, I, that sounds true. But we so. didn't. Oh, because, yeah. Okay, I remember things now from later, but they're all blurring. Mm -hmm. So, anyway, but yeah. Um, we all learned something new today. I learned that. Yay. The other thing. Okay, so the Thalen. I want to talk about the Thalen because. Eyebrows. Such yeah, a bizarre. <laughs> but I, I I love their culture for you know they, they, yeah they have the enormous eyebrows which is just sort of an interesting okay that's a that's a neat little tidbit it's, Brandon it's, it's the women as well as the men and they like put them behind their eye their ears and stuff I'm like that would be so weird to have eyebrows that went all the way well, back yeah, they droop down it almost makes me think of uh, just like almost a animal type. Yeah, like a fantasy animal, where like they have the bushy eyebrows, and it's like, I I don't know, it's just it's bizarre. And I always I always picture them as being white. Are they all white eyebrows, or are they? I don't different? think they. I don't think they're all white. I think Vistum's might be because he's older. Okay. Yeah, I think it's I think it's like their regular hair, which on this okay. world, who knows what that means? But yeah. Well, but the I, other I, thing is that they like like some of them wax them for vanity, and you know, it's just sort of a. Well, yeah, it, it makes perfect sense yeah. that they would style them. Yeah. Because it's their thing. Yeah. But just, it's one of those things you don't even think about super long eyebrows because for us, it is literally impossible. Our hair just doesn't grow that way. Yeah. And so it's just sort of a fun little, huh. That and then their overuse of consonants. Oh. That's they have way too many that. consonants in their names, <laughs> more than they're allowed to, I think be horrible to try and speak their language it almost reminds me of welsh because it seems like the 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 vowels that they have are like wise mm. and and so you have vistum and vrissen and it just it, it it reminds me of welsh so i could see that yeah okay let's go to what i feel is one of the most bizarre but amusing interludes She's hilarious with axes the collector Oh my goodness. I think that's going to turn out to be the most important one of all these interludes, actually. I think the one with Baxel might be more important. So this is the reason I think the the Axes one is more important. Um, it covers a wide variety of topics. First of all, he's Amian, mm -hmm. which is... They're supposed to be dead type of thing. And yeah, there's been a purging of the homeland essentially yeah and so there's that his biology is utterly bizarre he's <laughs> blue right it's not just that he's blue his fingernails are he shapes his his himself yeah they can shape he's a shape shifter. they shape themselves but most importantly his shadow goes the wrong direction i've forgotten about that that's so right. the thing about that doesn't that happen in the cognitive realm it, I, it happens. We've seen it happen a couple times. I know it happened. Yeah, like yes, no, it happened. I think briefly near the start or something of book two, and like it tips her off to something being up. And I think that's because you know when she surge binds, she goes into the cognitive realm. At least part of her. Yeah. So something's going on. I don't know what, but something's going on. And so, and so the fact that he's studying Spren, it 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 just it, there's I, it almost feels like he's stuck halfway between the two realms. Well, and then on top of it, he's not he he's studying he's trying to catalog all the Spren. Why? What's his goal? What's he doing here, buddy? I don't know. Yeah. And again, and since the Spren are of the cognitive realm, I, you know, I just sort of wonder if that's a part of it. But the, the interaction between him and the beggar just cracks me up. Because... Oh, it, it took me a while when I was listening to it the second time that I was like, oh, wait, 
he he's totally playing the beggar. Like, because I hadn't realized that until part way into the thing, and he's like, "Oh no, it'd be so terrible to give me your sackcloth so I can have some." Clothes. I can only be banished by the sacred cloth. <laughs> and then, of course, it gets stolen by the kids, and he's taken to jail. He's in the middle of like the port or whatever, and he's like, <laughs> "Well, that's great. I guess I can find prison sprint again." <laughs> Incarceration <laughs> sprint. Incarceration sprint. Captivity sprint. I think it was. Captivity sprint. That's oh, right. yeah, that, yeah. To which you're just like, how is that even a thing? <laughs> how are how are can people focus on anything if there's spren like everywhere for every situation? It almost feels like how how do you? Well, not just, Amy, like... given that you have a couple of spren running around your house, you tell us. <laughs> Those are sprites. Oh, you, you learn to tune them out when you have to. And <laughs> and this is the part where I dropped the joke I did in the pre-show. They're Amians. Oh. Get it, everyone? Uh... Get it? <laughs> it's funny. Because Amy. Yes. Totally spelled wrong, though. It's funny because oh. Amy. I think I just found the title drop. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, a, I'm comfortable with this. So. <laughs> puns. Puns are not my strong point. Anyway. Anyway. Um, now, okay, I want to skip what we have listed for the next one, just because since we're talking about somebody who's studying Spren, I think we've got a good segue into... Uh, well, sorry, wait, wait, sorry, no, we, can, we can't shift just okay. yet. The okay. other reason it's important, what is up with the giant spren? Yeah. That's something. I don't know what it, it is, is but it, it's it something. At the same time every, every day, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like clockwork. Like, it can literally be, you can set your, your time. By it. It's like, oh, it showed up, I can, there's my time. Also, apparently there are watches, so. Why not? Yeah, Bill. Why they not? Storm, they probably have stormlight as their battery. Oh, probably. It's a Fabriol. We, yeah. Yeah. It's just sort of a. Oh, you're, you're, I guess watches a are a thing. Well, they do show them in book three. Do they? Yeah, because um, Navani gives one to Dalinar, but it's like an arm watch. It's really big. Okay. I remember that. That's uh, right. Randomly, because he's right. like, "Oh, I actually have to keep track of where I am at a certain time now because I have this." So I remember That's they true. have watches in books. Yeah, three. so the giant the giant sprint are going to be a thing. No idea what, but it's going to be a thing. Yeah, that's they to be good. so. That's why I think this chapter, like, there's something going on there, and I, I don't know what. But when we find out, ooh, our, Kalani raises is, a good point in the, good in the point. chat. That being, he says, sprint are bigger in the cognitive realm. Could this mean something? Like, usually we only get a little part of them in the physical realm. That's right, because like the like pain sprint are like a a body but it's like their head only shows up through or whatever stuff like that i thought uh -huh. things that's, true. that's right we only see part of them instead of everything i wonder if it's just like a weak spot in the cognitive realm like or a, the realm. where the barrier is weak between realms or something it's, maybe maybe that's where that one pops that's up an interesting thought i'll have to give that some more consideration very good unfortunately thought. we can't focus on it right now because we we still have a whole lot to do and we're way behind <laughs> um Okay, so no, Jaren and Ashir, uh, this seems one that I think Jordan might be best to talk about, just because it's very, very scientific. Say uh, the the, the, the two Ardens, scholars yes. who are studying spring. Go science For, men, go. First of all, they're adorable. <laughs> they are adorable. In my scientific opinion, they're very adorable. But it's like, isn't it sort of uh, straying into the realm of quantum physics almost? It kind of is, but so here's the things I find interesting about it, because actually the science of things is is very is very interesting. The fact that she's sitting there trying to study uh, flame spren, and the fact that you measure them changes their size, and that's very quantum. That's that's so quantum it gives me flashbacks to classes I can't believe I actually took, but. Mm. Uh, so that's interesting just in and of itself. But then there's also just the simple fact that that guy completely went into the Ardentia for no other reason than it's not cool to eat the food that he likes eating. <laughs> she suspects that's the case, isn't it's it? It's totally the case. That guy <laughs> that guy he has a sweet sugar. tooth. That guy has a huge sweet tooth and <laughs> that's amazing to me um but no the fact that having having a sweet tooth i can agree that yeah i would i would find a way to, to make that happen 
<laughs> but yeah, it's it's interesting that you know that's a thing, and it's also interesting that she's sitting there measuring flame spread and just holy cow, look if we uh, we measure this, this is these are things that are happening, and you're just sort of left to sit there and be like, huh. So, we're uh, well, and, we're doing this. It sort, of, it sort of makes sense because again, we find out more that Spren are sort of leaking through the cracks from the cognitive realm, and so the fact that they are specifically considered, you know, they're based on the way that people think of them, they're going to adhere to that. Yeah. You know, that suddenly, they're they're that. shifting back and forth, and then she has in her mind, okay, this one is nine inches or you know three inches long. And it suddenly it in her mind it's three inches long, and so it's like okay, that's what I am. And then it changes if it's measured, and she, and she leaves the room, and uh -huh. it's or if or if he's in the other room and he erases or something like that, and that's the it's no longer recorded, days. right? Yeah, it's, it's, it, it's yeah, it's just such a cool idea. And I'm well, like, especially hey, Brandon, I'm... with them being cognitive beings, it makes uh -huh. perfect sense. And it, well, and it's also it in some ways identifies a, a little bit of the spren i i get i'd say i say human we all know what we mean by that human right. relationship why do spren want these things well because without them spren lack definition they they lack mm -hmm. any like they just sort of exist and we see that a bit in the other chapters with kaladin and uh siri and sil or sil siri different person um but they sit there and you can't bond with Kaladin. It's very true. Although I think we can do anything with an adium spike. But the uh the thing that's interesting about that is it does highlight that hey, maybe this is why Spren are attracted to civilization. Is they are being given form by humanity. They don't really truly exist until their thought into existence. Uh -huh. Like, it's one thing for there to be flame spread. Flames can exist independent of, of humanity. Lightning strikes wood, boom, flame spread. Lava, it happens. But there's things like honor spread, cultivation spread, lie spread, captivity spread. These things that are conceptual in nature mm -hmm. that couldn't exist if there wasn't a being to think about it. It's, I think, therefore I am, mm -hmm. taken to the next extreme of, I think, therefore you are. Now, cultivation we... spren are more are, are more than just basic, because yeah. they're tied to a shard as well. Have but... we witnessed any animals having spren around them? We, Shadium. Well, well, and we know that there's, a, we think they're gravity spren, uh, with the great shells, it's what lets them actually exist. Right. So uh, yeah, that because I know like sky eels have like wind spread, but that's also dealing with movement and yeah. But it might. But in this world that has existed with spread for who knows how long, it would make sense. There would be animals that can utilize spread that have somewhat bonded to them on sort well, of. A... I was I was even meaning just like. If an animal is in pain, does pain spread show up, or is it only people in pain? That I don't know. Because that, that we was didn't kind see. Of my we, I don't. It did is... we see any pain spread around the crustacean that non Balot was ripping the legs off of? It wasn't mentioned, but he may just not have noticed them. Because... Yeah, he may not care. I just that good, yeah. That, that, that's that one was... of the that's one of the interesting things also about having these different um, narrators because you know the the concept of the unreliable narrator. You also. They may not notice something that you would find that important. Person B would have would have been like, "That's really important," but person mm -hmm. A doesn't care about that. It also allows Brandon to have certain things happen in areas without telling us about them, because <laughs> they wouldn't they wouldn't comment or think about it. So exactly. Like, oh. And that and um, Kalani points out in the in the chat that pure like fish and I can I could see them having some kind of spren thing going on because there's like fish that can cure certain things or whatever else or and they make you lucky or luckier yeah. yeah it's it's I, I... but we don't know if that's their own uh just mm -hmm. superstitions right that's... That's true. it could it could be like Asian medicine where it's right. just like oh where all the things that worked became medicine and the rest became 
Or it's like, oh yeah, I totally need a rhino horn. It'll make him super sexy. Anyway. Uh, Jordan's oh. referencing Dara. I am. Dara O'Brien, if you can get over the fact he swears like an Irishman because he's an Irishman, it's great. Absolutely funniest comedian in the world. Um, and so we've got one last interlude, and then we do want to talk about the epigrams. There's one in particular we want to focus on, but anyway, so Baxel. Mm. I had to look him up because I'd forgotten what he did, but uh -huh. then I was like, oh, I loved that scene. It was weird, but I really liked it. Well, I yeah. reread it, you know, and he kept talking about the mistress, and I was, and I hadn't figured out who the mistress is. Uh, I went to the copper mine, and suddenly I'm like, oh! Ding! All the lights go on. Right! That! <laughs> yep. Because, hey, the heralds are coming back. Well, and she's been around, and she's just been destroying all her own statues, and that was actually referenced earlier, because, uh... Who I was think it was it. It was Zeth noticed that it, there was I, one missing. I yes. think it, I think it was Zeth. I think yeah, it was in was, there. It was either was, Seth or. Uh... It was. I think it was Zeth because he was on his way to go kill Cavalar. Yeah, it was in the very. It was in the prologue. Okay. And he noticed, and he's like, "There's, there's only nine. Why aren't there ten? Yeah, that's weird. And I totally didn't connect all well, those dots until I was reading the Copper Mine yeah. thing. Yeah. But yeah, so uh, Baxel is just. First off, I kind of love the fact that he's in, in, entranced by by Shalash. You know, he he sees her and he's just like, she's so beautiful. <laughs> it's just sort of a fun little. Per, uh, well, she is she is kind person. of the goddess of beauty or something, right? Her herald creativity. Beauty. Well, it also mentions beauty. And yeah, it, called the herald of beauty and born. Okay. All I yeah. know is that she's way out of his age range. <laughs> she's also she's also I was the one that expecting league, but no. She's also the one that Shalan is named after. Oh Except yeah, that Shalan's oh. name is non-symmetrical because that's right because it's almost symmetrical because you don't want to be be being cocky and being like the heralds, you know, and being totally symmetrical. You have to be more exactly. Vorin is a modesty is a very strange modesty. It's so bizarre. Yeah, my name would not be at all great. Just three letters. Uh, okay, so let's go into the epigrams. Uh, so the first set of epigrams we have are basically the are the death rattles. Oh. The first time you I came across these, it creeped me out because it just mentioned. It says it came from this person. This is a little bit about them seven seconds before death you're like and you just think what <laughs> who's recording this you know it's like and so and i mean it's all ages all ranges all gender you know whatever else and it's like so who are people going out and killing these people or i mean because you're reading some of the descriptions and, and kind of <laughs> yeah and that's the thing is that the, we find out oh teravangian you are a creepy 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 man <laughs> yeah and you've been causing all of these deaths but the thing that's interesting is, again, he has it justified in his own head. Because these are people who are dying anyway. Yes, he may have sped it along. He's easing their suffering. It's making it a little bit faster. But, oh, gosh. Oh, oh gosh. <laughs> people are bringing like, them. There's, like, kids in there, too, and you're like, you're killing children? Well, because they're posing as healers. Mm-hmm. And, well, so... and, they, and the, this is the thing. They are healers. He, he's trying to save the people he thinks he can. But the ones that he decides he can't, he's just like, okay, let's he's, speed he's this doing, along. Get the, keep doing, the ball moving. Yeah, he's doing triage, kind of. Mm -hmm. it's a lot of it, which I don't remember where I read it, but there was... Anyway, but like the rules of triage that you, you do who makes most saveable and then right. go the different rules that way. Yeah. Yeah, he definitely... Uh... He, oh, it was. Uh, he doesn't. He make. I think he makes sure that the people he gets the death rattles from are people who are going to be missed or not going to be missed. So it's not I think obvious. That's, that I think that's that true. He's, that he's pulling people off, mm -hmm. you know, and doing that. Yeah. Well, and uh, you, the triage that was Kaladin's father. Oh, yeah. that's right. I was yeah. like, I, I remember somebody said that, but I can't yeah. figure out who. That makes sense. Yes. <laughs> well, and it and it's also the difference between a. Uh, because he ha very much so has an apothecary's mindset where he's worried about the cost. But mm -hmm. 
but it's yes. on a much grander scale, whereas Kaladin is a surgeon. Well, I mean, he's Very a king. Focused, yeah. he's, he, he has to <laughs> pay attention to the finances of and keep things running. And yeah. so... Um, the third one you can, is basically Yesna's notes as she's studying the Voidbringers. She talks, you know, she cites all the different things that she finds. I unfortunately can't remember a whole lot of the th things, the specifics of what she finds, and so I'm yeah, not sure how Yeah, it seems to... like it was just, it felt more imagery-like than anything to me. Well, the thing but I found in... with the other books, too. Well, so the, her, uh, like, a lot of what she discovers about them is the fact that she's viewing this from a very much of a... a, uh, like, she's looking for whatever little information she can get. Mm -hmm. And so she's looking at children's stories and right. just all these very interesting places to try and find someone for someone who is one of the preeminent scholars of the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just found that interesting. Because well, again, like... yeah, if you, when you're when you're desperate for any little tidbit of information that you can glean you're digging through every single source you can and then hopefully you can trace that source back farther until you get to the origins. Yeah, kind of just like with the Grimm's um, fairy tales how they've been so sanitized throughout the years and I think I have some of like the original or close to original ones and they're a lot darker I haven't gotten very far through them and I'm like wow, that's quite a bit freakier well, than it's cause what the, you normally get Yeah, because the concept of a fairy tale because back then they don't really have much of a use for entertainment because everyone's dying by age like 22 oh. and so everything is designed to just try and tell them how to survive and so the stories mm -hmm. tend to just be like and then it ate them, why? well because we're trying to teach kids to wash their hands or, you know, whatever the story is. And yeah. it, it's Don't typically... Don't run out in the woods by yourself. You will die. Yeah. And so you you teach them these stories. And that's what she's looking at. Because they're now in the part of a... Uh, of of their life cycle where they've moved past a lot of the, the ancient fears. They now have a very highly developed society with... Low, with mm -hmm. some fabrials essentially being low-level computers and mm -hmm. all this other stuff that they're doing, and they're they've lost all the original fear that they had of the Voidbringers because they're they've now moved into legend. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they're and they're comfortable and not worried about it happening again. They're all yeah. done. It's great. We're fine. The original fairy tales, it, it's very reminiscent of Dwight Schrute from The Office. The learn your rules, learn your rules. If you don't, you'll be eaten in your sleep. <laughs> Why does my brain reserve just power for that? Yeah. I can't remember okay. anything important. I can remember okay. that. Beyond that, okay. And then, of course my favorite of the epigrams that I really, really, really want to talk about is the letter. Oh my gosh, the letter. This what is, is pro this is probably where I, I actually pasted the... You pasted oh, no, it in there? No, oh, I guess I didn't. I will do that right now so you don't have to go find it. Because I'm like, hey, I've got the whole book. I don't know where it is in here. Too big. There it is. It's at the bottom of the show the, notes the... now. Okay. But, yeah, so this is probably where we get the most information on the Cosmere itself is from these letters that show up in the respect in the respective books this one because this one as you read it you realize oh this was written by Hoyd mm -hmm. and this is one of the most frank dis discussions that Hoyd has had he's still Hoyd he's still got little lines where like he says um, he says, I realize that you're probably still angry. That's pleasant to know. Much as your perpetual health, I have come to rely upon your dissatisfaction with me. It's very, very hoid. <laughs> and I, I like one of his later ones where he's like, you've accused me of arrogance. You've you accused me of perpetuating my grudge. Both accusations are true. <laughs> <laughs> it's like not even to deny it. But yeah, so hoid is communicating with some being. Um, I've done some research, research and Apparently, I I was I, I assumed it was a shard mm -hmm. that he was communicating with. It's apparently not. Who is it supposed to be then? 
apparently it's somebody from the uh, dragon from the from Dragonsteel, the first book that he wrote. A dragon. I still have to read dragon. Anyway, but that that's like there there's way too much to talk about on that aspect. We'll we'll discuss that outside of the podcast because I still need to sort of wrap my head around it. I just learned that ten minutes before we got on, uh, we started airing, but. You know, he talk. It, it's just very interesting. They start discussing the events that led to the Cosmere as we know it, to the shattering, to and the people who were involved. Start. He uses the the actual names of the vessels who are now bearing the shards, mm-hmm. and it's just really interesting because we start to see this behind the scenes story that's going on. And yeah. Like he, he refers to race, who of course we know now is Odium. He refers to, I believe, he does he refer to Ati in this one, or is that in the... Yeah, he talks yeah. about Ati. And he talks about how Ati was a kind, generous person before. And so we, can, so we start learning, okay, holding the shards starts to affect the person, because they're just that overwhelmingly powerful yeah who would know he, we hear the name Bavadin where who is I believe the shard on um I'm blanking on the name the one from white sand autonomy oh, I don't... autonomy but I can't remember the planet's name Taldane oh, okay and he also talks about Aona and Sky being dead yeah which right. are Elantris yeah that's dominion and devotion not in that order. But it's just... So, Brandon has given us a glimpse into the Cosmere. He did sort of the same thing with the Hero of Ages uh, epigrams, because you have this cosmic being making musings, and so you see there's more beyond the story. And this one takes that to another level, because suddenly it's a discussion between these beings who were very, very aware of the Cosmere as a stance, who were actually there at the shattering. Mm-hmm. And the so. the stakes that are involved here are interesting because you get the impression that while some people are concerned, uh, maybe they're not as concerned as he is, and that's kind of interesting. Mm-hmm. You, would, you would think everyone would be concerned, but... Yeah. Well, well especially because... Up to up till now, our experience with the shards has been very, very much a cosmic one. These are the gods of these worlds, mm-hmm. and Hoyd treats them as individuals. These are people that he knows personally, and so rather than you know praying to them or worshiping them, Hoyd has a personal relationship with them. Some of them like him, some of them don't. And the ones who don't, really don't. (laughs) Yeah. And it's just, and so it's just very interesting seeing that here's this character who we're familiar with. There are other characters who may be good people who disagree with him. Suddenly, how trustworthy is Hoyt? Do we trust him? I want to trust him, but should I? (laughs) Definitely yeah. not. And so I mean, it's just future scenes with him. You're like, I don't know if he's as because at first I always thought Hoyd was kind of a good guy and he was uh-huh. he just had everybody's best interest at heart. And then later on, he full on he flat out says to Shalon, he's like, no, if you get in my way, I will. Trash. I will watch this world burn. And you're like, oh, well, that's kind of scary. <laughs> but yeah. the thing is, he doesn't say out of out of anger or as a threat. He's just saying, I have a goal, and mm-hmm. that's how important my goal is. And so. It's yeah. just, he's this super complex character, and I love, love, love. Every little tidbit Brandon puts in the books about the Cosmere, it just makes me grin, because there's more. Mm-hmm. So. Oh, boy. Gosh, there's just so much going on. All uh, things are happening. Yeah, any other thoughts on the letters? Or the letter, I guess? There's another letter in the next book. Spoiler alert. I almost feel like I need to read the, the books like twice in a row or something or read read the chapters and then like 
go back mm -hmm. and read them slower because there's there's so much and I'm yeah. terrible at connecting all the little dots and everything and then it takes me being copper mind or 17 shard or talking to you guys and being, oh I totally didn't connect that random thing that should have just clicked right there yep now I've gone through and you know because there's basically a, a small chunk of the letter at the beginning of each chapter I've gone through and transcribed them all into a single mm -hmm. um Collection. I'll yeah. I just pasted that at the bottom of the show notes. I'll keep that there for if people want to check it out and use it as an easy reference. You can find the show notes by there's a link in the description on the podcast. So, um, so anyway, as always, we want to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to keep creating new episodes of the Sandersonian Institute of Cosmere Studies. The show continues to be free for everybody, but if you want to support us, even with just a dollar or two per episode. You can go to patreon.com slash Cosmere Studies. When you become a patron, you get immediate access to our Discord channel where we've got a community growing. We've got, we're starting some discussions in there and getting to know each other and just chatting. It's a lot of fun. On Discord, you can continue the discussion about the Cosmere and the show itself. You also get bonus content like the 6-7, a collection of seven pieces of content that we find each episode that the hosts want to share. You'll also get early access to any bonus shows that we produce in the future. Um, automatic entry into any giveaways that we have and more. And of course, you help us to continue to make the show and improve the quality of the episodes. As we get more patrons, we'll be able to record episodes more frequently and we'll be able to invest in better equipment to improve the audio and video quality for our listeners and viewers. Now this week, we actually have a few new patrons that we would like to thank. Um, First is Tyler, no last name given, Mark K, and Kalani, no last name given, who has actually been in the uh, the chat this evening. Mm -hmm. She's had some good thoughts. Yeah. So thank you so much for your generosity. It's because of your donations that we're able to keep putting out new episodes. We're getting now, closer I, to our, uh, our first goal. We are getting a lot closer, so yeah. Yay! Um... Now, outside of the podcast, each of us has our own projects uh, where we are doing our own thing. Amy, where can we find you when we're not recording? Um, I'm on pretty much all the social media things. I'm on Twitter as Coincidence Cosp because the name is too long. I'm on Facebook, whoa, Facebook as Coincidence Cosplay and Props, and I'm on Instagram at Coincidence underscore Cosplay. And I do lots of costume things and random pictures and I'm putting up some of my pictures from Fanex right now so there's some better professional shots compared to me just being like here's my phone or <laughs> sometimes being like husband you need to take pictures of me now do it <laughs> but right now I don't know if, if you guys saw the Instagram Facebook and Twitter feed for the podcast I am working on Kaladin Spear which I looked at a reference picture and I don't have quite the right spearhead but it's close um but I just have to do everything else on it because I have a PVC pipe, but I'm thinking I have some leather. I'm going to wrap around it for the connection piece. And I don't know if I'm going to try and do a, a knife to attach to it or what, because it references that in the book, but I don't know exactly how to do it. So it may just be close to being <laughs> this spear, but that's what you do I do what you can. Yeah. Do the best and, you can. And Jordan, how about you? What uh, you can always find me, twitch.tv sl slash splice stream. I do mostly uh, Smash Brothers amiibo-based content where we have been absolutely dorking out over everything <laughs> they keep releasing with the with oh, the new Smash Brothers coming up, and I am getting just all too hyped, and December 7th cannot come soon enough. Um, yeah, I'm planning on trying to get that day off of work. And just doing an all-day stream, ruining my voice. It'll be great. Oh, boy. And hey, if we have an episode the next Monday, then we'll get to hear Jordan's voice after an all-day stream. So, <laughs> yay. <laughs> uh, as for myself, when I'm not here, I am, of course, writing board game reviews over at the Innkeeper's Table at www.innkeeperstable.com. Unfortunately, I haven't written any for a while, but I'm hoping to dive back in. I need to get one out sometime soon. Um, and you can also follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at, at Innkeeper's Table. If you've enjoyed the show, please head over to iTunes and give us a five-star review. It really, really makes a big difference in bringing in new listeners. 
Um, in fact, bec besides becoming a patron, it's the best way to support the show. And of course, be sure to share the show with other Brandon Sanderson fans you know. Um, now, this concludes our discussion of The Way of Kings. So before we move on, though, Jordan, Amy, any final thoughts? The interludes and the like just the way it was set up at the end of each dramatic moment, essentially that divided the book, uh -huh. I found to be very satisfying. But the problem with the interludes is you know that you're only going to be there for a moment. It's, it's pretty much uh -huh. like get you, you just gotten, just got on the roller coaster. You took it, but it only lasted a short time. Just like, but I wanted, I, there I should have been more. more. It's sort of like when you get yeah. to the bottom of a Pringles can. You're just like, but I kept wanting more. What is more. it with you and Pringles lately? They're delicious and wonderful, <laughs> and you just need to get over it. Jordan, they're not giving us money. You, you need to stop. I mean, promoting. they're horrible right until Pringles decides to <laughs> to support us. So Pringles, oh, I love, understand I love the that. the book, and it's a giant beast, but it's wonderful, and it's pretty. And, uh, and I can't wait to talk about later Shallan and other things because then it's more book exciting. two Shallan is amazing yes boots boots book three Shallan gets frustrating again but book two Shallan is amazing book three gets better it, it takes time but it gets better so not enough boots I know not enough boots too much everything else oh gosh I just mm. there's gonna be ten of these things that's gonna take up, like, no, no, right no, no. There's going to be 10 Oathbringers. That's the small version. Mm. <laughs> that's right. This is this is the abridged. <laughs> this, so that's, this is my final note. The fact that they told him when they first made uh, Way of Kings, there's like, Brandon, this is the publishers talking. The, this is the page count that you're limited to. I know we normally say that, and you then go 10% over, and we say, okay. We mean literally we don't have binding technology that will make a book bigger than this. You're physically... I thought, they, I thought they, like, partway through, like, one of them, they, like, were able to make it a little bit bigger. Well, I think something. that's what he said about, uh, about Oathbringer. Oath, Oathbringer, was they <laughs> they had developed something else to let, let him get, like, another 50 pages or something. I don't know. It was something... <laughs> Something what he was it? talking about. And... Necessity breeds invention or... Yeah. All yeah. I know is what is stopping Brandon from writing bigger books? Physics. <laughs> Physics is is stopping him. Yeah. I already have like a shelf and it, it, it's split, but it takes up pretty much a whole shelf. And if, yeah, by the time the Cosmere is done, I'm going to have to have like two or three shelves that are just Sanderson. Oh my goodness. So Brandon, many... Brandon says... I am going digital only, only ebooks from now on. <laughs> <laughs> like, no, no, Brandon, we don't have the memory for that. For no, that no, memory. no. He'll, uh, he'll, then, but he'll have to release collector's editions for people's bookshelves. So, oh, that's true. Pretty books with DLC oh, no. stories. Oh, and his collector's editions are so pretty. Mm, I had to talk you out of one, huh? Yes, you did. I almost bought the one. Well, you almost had to talk me out of one, and then the price tag talked me out of it because that was that book was a hundred dollars, and even though I had just gotten a new job, I wasn't that crazy. <laughs> yeah, it's expensive. Uh, but seriously, really folks, if we if you ever want to uh, support the the podcast, understand that we could get Bill more horrible spending habits. So, <laughs> no, in all seriousness, thanks to the the new patrons. Uh, this isn't really a milestone that we've marked, but this is a big one for us because it means uh, the podcast is at the very minimum now paying for itself. Yeah, that's true. We're actually because it costs money to host a podcast on something that's close to reliable and it's not horrible or anything like that. But we're now at the point where it doesn't cost us money to host the podcast it just costs us a lot of time, which is way more preferable. One other note, this isn't to do with the the Way of Kings. This is to do with Brandon's books and bindings and stuff like that. Tomorrow, Brandon's final installment in the Legion trilogy comes out. Legion oh, Lies right. of the Beholder. I forgot about I'm behind. That. I, for, I, I forgot that that was... But yeah, that's tomorrow. So it com it's coming out in an omnibus. So it's all three mm -hmm. books in one copy. It's yeah, the yeah. Legion, the Life and Times of Stephen Leeds or something like that, I, I believe. Anyway, so yeah, look for that tomorrow. That's exciting. 
My my copy should be getting here tomorrow. I think it's it's set to deliver. I'll see it next month. All right. Well, guys, we're, we're done with this book. We've only got two more of these books to go. Phil, what's next? But that's the thing. So next week, we will be, or not next week, in two weeks, we will be discussing a much, much shorter work. A short story that Brandon wrote called Shadows for Silence in the Forests of Hell. And we will be having a guest author joining us, or guest host joining us, who is an author. Mm -hmm. uh, Charlie mm -hmm. Inholberg will be joining us as a guest host and discussing that novel with us. I'm really excited about that. And that's the giveaway week, too. Yes. And Charlie will actually be the one who will be doing, I'm not sure if we're going to, if she's going to actively literally draw a uh, something or if we're just gonna she's gonna run a random number generator or something we'll figure something out she will be a part of that drawing though it's so the only way to if, make it fair yeah if any of you have if any of our listeners have read the books uh the paper magician magic bitter magic sweet followed by frost there she's she's written several books now and if you haven't read her stuff you should check it out and if you have get excited because she's going to be on with us so that'll be fun if any of our listeners have questions or feedback, we'd love to hear from you. Let us know what you think of the show and what your favorite moments from the Cosmere have been. What topics have you been dying to know more about? What Cosmere theories are racing around in your heads? You can email us at CosmereStudies at gmail.com, as well as on our social media accounts or in the comments section of our videos on YouTube. If you want us to discuss, we recommend email. It's just easier for us to keep track of. Um, but who knows? You might even read the and discuss your email during one of our episodes. In addition to our live episodes that stream on twitch.tv slash innkeepers table every two weeks on Monday nights at 7.30 p.m. Pacific time, 10.30 p.m. Eastern time, our listeners can find our videos on YouTube or the audio versions of our podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, and just about any other service that carries podcasts by searching for Cosmere Studies. You can also follow us and contact us through Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook under the profile at Cosmere Studies. That's all we've got for this week's episode of the Sandersonian Institute of Cosmere Studies, but we will be back for more talk about the Cosmere in two weeks on October 1st, when we will be joined by Charlie in Holmberg for our discussion on Shadows for Silence in the Forest of Hell. And until then, on behalf of Jordan, Amy, and myself, thanks for listening. And remember, there's always another secret.